government is going to first. Do you think that gentrification is part of the natural process that occurs with cities that are productive enough to the extent that they grow in terms of population size? And we're happy to promote systems of policies that ensure that this process doesn't slow down, but in fact is encouraged to the extent that it's beneficial for the state. Perhaps instead of starting with what gentrification is, because that's already a beautiful slide, it's important to first characterize and understand why cities grow. And cities grow as a result of just natural confluence between capitalistic factors as well as geographical factors that ensure that these particular city centers became the interest points, the focal points which group businesses and the flow of blood, or the, sorry, the, the core blood of the economy really grows and stems from. The fact that we're dealing with a motion that suggests these cities are rapidly growing suggests that these particular areas and businesses and the capital intensive industries that work with these, uh, within these zones are ones that are thriving and are ones that should be motivated in driving these particular uh, situations. But the realities that come with this also need to be taken into account. That when you deal with growing cities as a population, even without talking about gentrification just yet, it means you do with policies such as increased or tax infrastructural systems that deal with things such as roads or services and the like, and all those systems are already going to be taxed because of the nature of the economics that happens within these city centers to begin with. But it also implies that the inevitable result are things such as zoning, things such as city planning, to ensure that the use of resources within these areas are naturally going to be a factor that best, uh, that best efficiently locates people and resources via the one another. Gentrification, therefore, is a process that accommodates and is a corollary to this particular system, to which the government sees these particular processes and encourages it along its way. So it involves things such as building particular areas, increasing uh, zones or parks or whatever, or just making the middle income in, in earners or high income earners uh, a lot more happier where they, are, where they are. It means a lot of wasted or neutral space just because it has tangible benefits to the lives of individuals, and we have to stand for all these particular things, even if it means there are some negatives that come along the way. The starting point here is this that there are innumerable benefits to the working class individuals who are the lifeblood of these particular city centers. And we think that fundamental to the ability for governments to decide what's good for their countries is to increase the ability for these city centers to remain productive. And the first most important factor here is that it markedly makes income with the middle income earners of these individuals who best maximize all the process of gentrification far more productive and far more influential and far more useful in the jobs that enable these cities to grow in the first place, that retain the high capital investments that come in these countries um, as a whole. Corollary to this is two things. First, increased infrastructure development, which I'll deal with in just a moment. But second of all, increased investment in these particular areas because it's a landing spot to which individual workers can reside as a form of human capital that increases the ability for these city centers to maximize efficiency and productive wealth as a whole. All of these things we think that leads to a natural trickle down effect, such as increased ability for jobs or business within these areas to diversify with yeah. the kinds of goals that enables different types of workers to be employed within their businesses. We accept that part of this also means that zoning implies that they will also outsource the kinds of work that they do to different parts of these cities or these nations. I'll explain why that's a good thing later on in my speech. But the point I was making or alluded to earlier is that inevitably, because such investments are going, so, sorry, because such infrastructure invariably is going to be taxed, gentrification is an excellent motivation to improve, uh, uh, to, or rather to provide ex uh, external stimuli to ensure that these service sectors or service, uh, economic services uh, markedly, uh, are improved as well. Just because these are the essential, uh, essential uh, things of produce or amenities that are, required, that are required by any society, um, such as policing, such as uh, you know, emergency services, and the like. The point here is that these all have very subtle influences and impacts to the middle income and low income uh, individual workers as a whole. That is the second core point of our OT case, which is this. That we don't think that sure, you may be pushed out of these particular city centers, but first of all, we think that this is an inevitable consequence of how these cities grow, and we don't think that that's a bad thing as a whole. But second, your life markedly improves. Few reasons why. First, you continue to work within these city centers, assuming that you do. And when you do, you, you as a whole also benefit from these hipster cafes, you also benefit from the increased ability to earn major income from these areas just because your economy yeah. is growing as a whole as well. We think there's inherent trickle-down effects that happen from the increase in the ability for these, uh, for these economies to capitalize around these city centers to start with, but also, more fundamentally and more subtly, their lives get better because the infrastructure around them gets better as well. And these are things that cannot be put, that when numbers can be put uh, um, to, yeah, a number can be put to the increased value of their lives as a whole. But within these systems, it creates a natural binding process to enable, uh, sorry, uh, a natural coupling process that enables um, the natural effects of a uh, growing city to enable these individuals to lead their lives, uh, these middle and lower income individuals to lead a better life uh, where they came from. So one, increased wages because of the kinds of uh, increased capital that flows into, into these spaces. But second, the natural incentive to counteract the kinds of um, negative impacts that happen or burden uh, these economies as just a natural result of increased population size growth. Last of all, why do you think gentrification is one, a natural outcome of these cities, and two, why this forwards the natural progression of geographic zoning of uh, growing cities as a whole? 
Yes. Gentrification means and increased efficiency means automation and luxury property. Sure. That also means the large population is going to be unemployed and homeless. How are those impacts uh, solved? No, sure, that's fine. That's what we're getting to, right? Um, that is an inevitable impact, or automation is an inevitable impact of any policy that we do is quite independent of gentrification anyway. But as I said, yes, it is an, an enhanced version of this. But that's what we get to. That you can't, you can't deny the natural realities of how economies are going to grow. Gentrification enables individuals who still are lucky enough to retain these particular jobs to continue, continue doing so. We suggest, and what I've said in my class like four minutes so far, is that this also creates jobs where there are special niches to do so, even if automation is a thing. But the result that you see in countries such as Italy or such as Germany is that you zone out these particular uh, groups where gentrification enables capital to be the focus of these city centres that moves the other kinds of jobs or relocalizes these jobs outside the city centres as a whole. We think this is a good thing. And this may be a radical proposition, but we're happy to say that's good. Because for one, that also coincides with where these individuals are able to be housed as a whole. It also makes it, it enables the different geographical uh, locales and nucleuses of how businesses are being created to be efficiently located within where they are best used. So capital will result within city centres, but you move other more labor tax industries or whatever not outside the city centres as a whole. We think this justification process naturally enhances this, but we don't think that that's a bad thing. In the realm of how economies are structured, that is not a bad thing to relocalize or to be uh, in, a, in, in a way capitalize how your you know complementary industries are best uh, fitted to each other. And gentrification enables the easing of this process by allowing individuals who are best here within their systems to leave the system in a way that is easy to them. But if they choose to stay, they enable or they, they benefit from the from the quality effects um, that trickle down to them as a whole. So in these systems. Basic systems or structures uh, enable these economies to best use, utilize the resources. And we think gentrification allows these industries to push themselves out in a, in a natural and economic, uh, in a way that's economic for them as a whole. That's why we're happy to propose. Yeah. Madam Chair, site government prioritizes the interests of the rich, of the property developers, and allows for those interests to go unfettered. They prioritize short-term economic growth through such capital injection at massive long-term demographic costs that will not be sustainable. We don't think this trade off is it. It's what it let's explore this. Right? Because they weren't very uh, they they didn't talk too much about the harms or very dismissive of the harms that come with gentrification. And we don't and we think these harms are massive and it's going to hurt the country in the long term. Let's walk you through them one by one. The first harm we get is like um, the, the, the fact that not every or, or let's let's characterize gentrification to a much larger extent. Right? Because we first recognize that people who are living in, uh, who are working class people, who are going to be in space, are likely to be living in uh, rental apartments. They are likely to be homeowners who are able to sell their houses at a massive premium where, as, the, as the building gets bought out, they're torn down for a uh, luxury condominium development, for example. This means they are likely to be forced out, having to move to somewhere else to live. In a world where there's going to be massive gentrification, where all of this is going to be happening at an unfettered and a breakneck speed, where most of the money vis-a-vis uh, uh, vis -vis property development is going to come from selling luxury condominiums, luxury properties, and, there's a, and there is a cap to how much capacity property developers have, we think to a large extent there's going to be a massive shortage of, um, of houses for those who are going to be um, who are going to lose their house, their rental housing in the city. So we don't think that's necessarily going to be a good thing because this means that the cost of living necessarily increase should they be able to find a house to begin with and if they don't then obviously alternative for those who are less well off right. are going to be ghettos especially in countries that aren't as developed to begin with we think that those are massive harms but, but even more than that, even if they're able to get these kinds of houses, as Brian has recognized, these are going to be places that are going to be outskirts of cities, that are going to have limited access to the city centers. Right? In, the, in the context of massively developed or massive development, we don't think transportation infrastructure is able to keep up. Rail or bus networks simply take lots of, a lot more time to develop. Like tunneling takes like years and billions of dollars. Yes, that's, yes. Not to, that's not going to come as fast as just building a new luxury condominium, Madam Speaker. This means it's 
going to take those people, those two hours, to get to the city center where they are working. He talks about uh, out moving some jobs to the outskirts. Not everybody, like if you are working in a massive developing, developing city, odds are the kind of jobs aren't manufacturing to begin with. The kind of jobs these people are working are lower end white collar jobs. Your executive and administration assistants, your secretarial work, your, your waiter at a fancy restaurant, Madam Speaker. These are the kind of jobs that exist in the city centre that become that take you three times, four times as long to get to and we think that's going to be problematic when it's going to be so much more expensive for you to out uh, and it takes so much more time for you to get there. We think moreover, Madam Speaker, and the next harm that, that, that exists is that we're going to see like, like um, strong, um, large communities who are going to be destroyed. We think, no thank you. We think like uh, the nature, of, like the, 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 the displacement of poor people to a large, or, or less people who are less well off means that the kinds of um, amenities that they are able to have in these areas are going to be diminished so much to that extent. What do we mean by this? It means that areas that are gentrified, and we recognize that gentrification doesn't mean all of those like um, rent control or lower cost housing gets demolished, but some of it, most of it perhaps, it means that the catchment for um, for grocery stores or catchment for cheaper like uh, place uh, cheaper places to shop like Walmart um, lose that lose that um, catchment pool and, and what has reacted instead are uh, whole foods. Right? We think that, that as, as property prices rise in these areas, um, your local park gets forced out for a craft beer place, for example, as Brian rightfully pointed out. We think your average working class person who is that waiter, who is that secretary and speaker will not be able to afford um, buying stuff at Whole Foods, at like organic food at three times the price. They will not be able to afford craft beers and all they want is a pint of their local lager, Madam Speaker. We think to another extent that they necessarily massively increase the cost of living, as I suggested to you already, in multiple facets. Madam Speaker, we don't think that's justifiable. But more than that, we told you, like, like we tell you, that this shutdown also means a loss of like welfare support or welfare development programs. To an extent that, uh, catch, that, that people who are able to remain in the city centre, like face greater pressures, they, they need even more social support at this point. But when, when you consider that, that the catchment of people has, or, or who require social support has diminished to a much greater extent, we think this means that the family service office, the welfare service office, is likely to close because there's not enough people who um, whom they could serve at that area. We think this means some people, more people fall through the cracks. That is a harm. But most importantly over here, we argue to you, no thank you, that, that um, you massively diminish the political voice of um, of those who are least well off. Because money talks in politics. We, have, we see that in Malaysia, obviously, yeah. obviously we see that in America as well. And we think to the extent that your richer people come in, their interests become predominant because those because they will be able to see them more they, they, will, they will be able to lobby governments significantly more effectively. The consequence, Madam Speaker, is that, that these poor communities, for often minority as well, will be marginalised. And we think that's obviously a harm when they get shut out of the political process. And before I go on, I'll take the smarter team. Oh, that's us. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, I just want to clarify, because Brian talks, uh, talks about how gentrification is a natural process. So how exactly are you going yes, to Yes, excellent. Okay, so I talk a bit about harm. So how are we going to mitigate these harms? I thought that was quite intuitive. Oh, right, let's talk about them now. So effectively, it is government taking an active role. You no, know, it's government taking an active role in urban planning. Right, to a large extent, um, like have significantly stronger zoning control laws, significantly stronger um, like ma a massive building of like wait, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, this means like public lots more public housing, lots more rent control. Effectively, you don't let property developers buy as much land as they're able to do so. Massive increases in stamp duty, for example, to not allow for for, for tearing down buildings or buying new buildings that easily, that cheaply, because things because it's a bit more too expensive to gentrify. This means all of these processes slow down to a large, much, much larger extent. Governments have time and ability to try and mitigate those harms. This means they're able to build public housing in the outskirts that are not going to be ghettos, for example. This means they have time to build those real um, infrastructure, to build bus infrastructure, to import buses as they get built. Right? We think all of these things necessarily mean that we are able to quote some of the benefits of, um, of gentrification or of the influx of money that happens. We acknowledge that, that this means that we will not get as much money, as much capital, as much uh, a, 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 um, as much benefit. But the but comparative is this, right? At point where you have, where, where you have minorities or, or just poor people, who are going to force out, who are going to be living in ghettos, where, 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 where systems of education or healthcare are going to be less accessible for them, at least in the short to medium term, we are going to see, see massive demographic problems in 10, 20 years, right? Where people are going to be malnourished, where people are going to be undereducated, Madam Speaker. This means the long term future of your working class is going to be decimated because they lack the critical skills for them to survive. They become disillusioned, disenfranchised by the state, and we think all of these are problems that government needs to deal with. Hopefully, Mami can do, do something about that. Sorry, can I make 30 seconds to the next? No. Uh, the daddy, Mami. Mm -hmm. Oh, my.
there's a high number of unemployed youths that exist in, like, for example, the southern states of Europe, right? for example, unemployment rate for youths is up to 20 to 30 percent, and a large problem is underemployment because they feel this illusion. They do not see uh, 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 an economic opportunities here. These policy changes things because when you are able to shape the economy in this particular instance to provide jobs, or more importantly, to provide the incentive to work hard to get into those jobs to begin with. No, thank you. So let's talk about the last thing. The, politi the politics of this particular policy is particularly important in this uh, situation. First and foremost, we need to understand when they talk about things like outers, uh, that, that, that is about like, the development of outer cities and how infrastructure will never reach them, there's a concession over to our side because it's only in our particular policy whereby these out outer skirts or cities in the outer skirts have a funding chance to be developed that at, at least the federal government will pay some form of attention or if the federal government will at least the state rep is able to gain some form of revenue to create an independent ecosystem on the outskirts yeah. but guys this debate is about inner cities ghettos that are right within our, uh, our midst like for example the Bronx in the United States and that's why like for example there is every incentive to make the roads a lot safer to build schools so that at least there are lots of students who, go, uh, who, who drop out of schools and join the gangs in these particular situations. Politics. The biggest problem that exists today is that we are able to employ a divide and conquer strategy. That there is a problem of ghettos. Whereby people on their own, they isolate themselves into like, this echo chamber or this isolated bubble and eventually become neglected and forgotten by the state. And because like what he said, that sometimes the interests of the rich and the poor are, divide, are, di are divorced. And the poor people do not have access to levers or power in those particular instances. On top of that, politicians are always trying to divide and conquer using gerrymandering methods. Your policy allows for that to happen. But it's in our policy whereby the economic supply and demand, like for example, because the middle class or the upper middle class can no longer stay in, like for example, the most expensive power cities, they have to go over there. Yes, they have some form of political power. They bring those particular political power into those particular cities. And this is an important thing, and they need to listen to this. Yes. Yeah, so all of your analysis so far about what Southern Europe, la, Bronx, la, quite irrelevant, right? Because these are rapidly growing cities or whatnot. How about you try to recontextualize all of your speech to show why everything you say is relevant? They are rapidly growing in terms of population, may, 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 may not be economy. We are arguing that the increase in population, especially with a richer fraction, is going to lead to the economic development in those particular instances. The gerrymandering uh, uh, point is an important point because you allow for politicians to get people to argue against their, uh, to, to vote against their own self-interest. This policy changes things. Because if you are a rich parent, or maybe an upper middle class parent, when you go to the school, you start to realize that perhaps firstly the school is too small, it's not safe, it's understaffed by this parent. Even if you do not believe that you need to help the poor, but at the very least, A, you are less likely to vote for, like, for example, tax cuts or the riches of the rich. And secondly, you will finally argue for more federal budget to education and no longer support, like for example, Trump, when, when the first thing that the education secretary is, uh, 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 does is to reduce the education budget. This is an important point because in the long term, barring all the short-term effects of our policy, we are the only team that can reunite the political interests of the rich and the poor people and solve equity to some possible extent. For all those reasons, I'm extremely proud. Thank you.
why am I going to give you a real context to this debate? Something that OG didn't want to talk about and instead chose to talk about the Bronx and Harlem. Two, we're going to give you what the biggest need for the go for government is, why survivability of the population should always be prioritized and why the state's <coughs> priority comes at the cost of gentrification and not at its benefits. So let's start with what the stance of all was and we make it very clear. We think that the gentrification creates the renewal and rebuilding of very specific facilities that don't help the population that were already there. But even if they are beneficial to that population, slowing it down is important in order for us to deal with the consequences of gentrification as they what? happen. If, let's then look at the, what the biggest need is, right? That's where we contextualize this debate. This debate is not about the Bronx because the Bronx is a consequence of gentrification. The Bronx is what happens when you allow for people to be pushed out of the city centre and move to the outskirts. That's where they form their gangs. That's where they form their communities that don't get the help. The concept of the Bronx <coughs> being able to be developed is the wrong idea because that's exactly what happens because of gentrification. What are the kinds of communities or, or cities that are currently rapidly growing? We look at Hyderabad, we look at Paulo Alto, we look at Surabaya, where these cities have, have large traditional rural populations that are being forcibly thrown out so that they can build factories, where slums are being forcibly demolished so that they can build housing for their middle income, uh, for, for their factory workers, okay. for, their, for their middle income employees, where they get pushed to areas that these individuals don't understand, don't like, and don't and aren't able yeah. to live in because they believe, well, the money is important to the community. The money makes, makes no difference to this population when these people are forcibly thrown out of their traditional Boy. heritage homes because they, they believe that a factory is important or, or, some, sort of, or some sort of economic yeah. outcome is more important. We think that is the context of the debate and that's the context of harms that they need to deal with on that side. So two things we need to talk about. One is this concept of whether or not these individuals gain any benefit from the growing of luxury property or the growing oh, yeah, yeah. of abilities there. Marvin says these people often already own some property. They can mortgage it and gain some benefit from it. That's just not true, right? Most of these populations <coughs> don't believe in home ownership and often are in rental properties as yeah, well. Yeah. So we think that there are two groups of people, right? People who live in traditional slum homes where the homes have no value whatsoever because they get demolished to be replaced. Or two, they are under rent what? control and live in rented apartments that belong to other people, that belong to like rich, ultra rich, MNC owners and that kind of thing yeah, yeah. and they have rent control on the prices. What happens when the market value Boy. controls what the price of those houses are in rental? The result is that these right, rental prices are going to go up to accommodate the middle class people that are flowing in for the gentrification population, the gentrification policy that happens in opening government. These families will get pushed out of their rental homes because they cannot Boy. afford the rent for that month or for the year oh, yes. that is coming. It's true, sure, inevitably maybe 15 years down the road we'll be able to develop some sort of system where they can live in proper housing that's affordable for them across the city. But what happens in that 10 years before we can build that property? We oh, think that these individuals end up being homeless on the street with no ability to go anywhere and being forced to find homes oh, yes. that are more affordable in places that are significantly far away from where they live. But the last thing that was problematic on this and which will compare the policies that come out at the end of the day is the concept that they say where middle and upper middle class people just won't stand for excessive gentrification because it will hurt them and therefore it will balance out. But that's opposition policy, right? That we want to create policies that put in place to slow down the process a little bit so that we can deal with it. So they cannot say that the upper middle class will stand up to the speed of the process of gentrification anyway because that's exactly what opposition policy is where we want people to be able to have a voice to slow down the process of gentrification or to be able to prevent it in any way. We think that's significantly more important than being able to say that we will go full speed ahead at any cost whatsoever Obvious. with no benefit to the groups of people that are the most vulnerable. Maybe not that sure. Yeah, your example of uh, Surabaya is that people actually own large blocks of land, but this land is incredibly not valuable. Your policy that dries up property prices or land prices allows them to sell away a bit of those land to give them the capital investment to start in a small and medium enterprises. So if you want to debate Indonesia and all this, then debate that particular context. Okay, okay. you realise Indonesia is not homogenous, right? We don't have just one type of person in the country. So let's break it down into a few different yeah, yeah. people, right? They only want to talk about the middle class people who have land or Ownership yeah. who have property. We think the most vulnerable people in the area do not own land. They do not own space. They do not own homes. They live day-to-day -day wages. They live in a, in a hut that belongs on slum land. These are the people that get evicted first because they want to use that land because your middle income yeah. population, as they claim, will hold on to the land and not want to sell for their own benefits. They, because they, of the increase in 
prices of the land. These are the individuals who won't sell their land for their gentrification purposes than for the ability to build your luxury condo or your factories. The land that will end up getting used is your slums, your huts that can be shut down because the government has control over those things. Well, In those situations, we think the poor population are the most affected and not your landowners. Your landowners will get no benefit but also very minimal harm. But the harm that comes to most is your larger population in the well, country well, is that you're poor. So what is the state's priority? <coughs> We think at the end of the day, the state's priority should always be about making sure that your most vulnerable in society are protected. Do we think that the economy is important? Sure. Do we think that we need to protect the ability to grow these cities and be able to get the economic success and capitalist success of these economies? Sure. But we don't think that it should be unfettered and unfiltered with no restrictions whatsoever because these are things that can be balanced with other, other needs or other priorities that the state has, including ensuring basic survivability. What is this basic survivability? It's not just about workers being replaced by automation, right? It's simple things like small mom and pop stores that are immediately replaced by your Whole Foods and your Walmart and your Target. We think that the claim that they make that these people can now compete because there's a bigger market, it's just false, right? When you have one Whole Foods, one Walmart and one Target in the same city, that's the end of the discussion, right? Every single small mom and pop store will shut down because there's just no business whatsoever. The concept of losing your entire livelihood, the entire thing you build your life up towards, to be able to do that means, means that you have no ability to replace it quickly. What's the alternative on our side? The alternative is that we do ensure that these individuals get trained to find different jobs, be able to learn their ability to survive in a different way. Because yes, Whole Foods coming in might be inevitable, but it will happen 10 years down the future, so we have time to create processes to allow for these individuals to create change and create dynamics. And that's the difference between slowing down gentrification and allowing it to be unrestricted. There will be three extensions coming out of closing governments. The first of which is talking about how current cities are saturated, what are the harms of those, and how we mitigate those harms. Secondly, how we create more opportunities for low-income groups when opportunities expand towards their areas. And lastly, we're going to talk about how the process of gentrification itself is an economic good for low-income groups. Let's first talk about how we make cities less saturated. Bear in mind that OG, tried to, uh, OG very, uh, very conveniently asserted that gentrification means more investment. And they also, very, uh, they also concentrated their analysis on talking about capital investments from middle class when they moved out. Talking about things like SMEs, for instance. We don't want to talk about that. We want to talk about things on a much vast, uh, uh, greater scale. We're talking about MNCs, yeah, for example. Yeah. Oh, no, you didn't say this. No, <laughs> MNCs, for example, when they have more space and access to like cheaper space outside of current yeah, saturated yeah. cities, they are more willing to invest in those areas as well. Yeah. Bear in mind, when you have middle-income people, they are they are uh, they are they are over there as well. Then you are able to accommodate for a range of employment, including being able to fill yeah. in your managerial yeah, positions, yeah, yeah. but also employing your, those people from low-income groups, uh, low-income groups to fill in your uh, uh, to fill in. Those kind, uh, the, 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 uh, those kinds of jobs. We, this therefore leads to more, uh, to more opportunities that they have. Do we admit that perhaps there is more, uh, there's necessarily more uh, still going to have slums? We agree, but we don't think that anything changes on the other side of the house, right? Look, when, uh, uh, in status quo, when you, uh, when you prevent gentrification from happening, it's just as simple as those places become the slum, right? Why? Because because low-income people are not likely to have any kind of political power in order to influence the building of infrastructure in the place. What are we talking about? So the kind of railways, the kind of like infrastructure that they want to talk about, they want to buy time for it. The problem on their side of the house is that they're never going to be able to actualize those benefits because there's very little incentive for people to expand into those areas when there's very little economic opportunity there. Instead, what we say is that uh, instead what we see is that economic forces or political forces 
I'm gonna push that. Uh, I'm gonna uh, be pushed away from the uh, from these ideas, so that the kind of uh, the kind of infrastructure that they wanted to have never never actually reaches people in those areas. Go ahead. Why do the economic opportunities in these areas suddenly disappear because we waited five years? Uh, no, no. You see, when there's no economic viability there, when there's no reason for you to go there, because you are uh, 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 because you you lack the kind uh, the kind of like for instance human resources that are there, right? Then we say that a lot of the uh, uh, then we say that a lot of the viability of the area economically goes down. When it's less economically viable, things uh, people who have extreme high amount of lobby power, your NNCs, your middle income people, who are likely to be lobby against going into those areas. Which means to say, you're not waiting for five years. You're more likely to be waiting for 20, 30 years for your train systems to ever be established because there's no reason for people to want to go there, right? Yeah. The, uh, okay, secondly, how do we create more opportunities for low income groups within those areas, right? I think the first thing we want to talk about is that there's also immediate benefits, right? Because we say that the middle class demands certain things when they move into those areas, right? Yeah, yeah. We're talking about the establishment of public schools, right? Yeah, they, yeah. They, they very briefly talk about this in Hoji, but why is it necessarily that we are able to, uh, we are able to get this benefit, right? First of all, the kind of squad schools, for example, right, are not as hard to build as your railway systems. We show we concede yeah, yeah. the railway systems are a bit harder, so we concede the oldest point of that. But schools are like as easy to build as your condos, right? Why why is it important that they are, uh, they are built in these areas? Because they're geographically much closer to people who are lower income in nature. Which means to say the cost of you going to school is a lot lower as well. Therefore, low income groups are much likely to attend schools and therefore in the long term be able to break yeah, yeah. out of the poverty cycle when they are able to equip themselves with at least primary education and even secondary uh, secondary and tertiary education in the future and therefore get themselves access to, high, uh, to, uh, to uh, higher value Jobs. We say that's important in terms uh, important in terms of bringing those benefits to the low income groups. Compare this instead to the fact that they are very far away in very concentrated inner city centers. We say that those are very unlikely to help the low income groups because it is uh, way too far and way too expensive for them to access. Closing goal. Can you elaborate a bit about how you say if we wait, let's say five years or four years, somehow the economic and political forces will now no longer want to gentrify the area? Please elaborate. Okay, like so. Like so, currently we have enclaves on the on the city ends, right? And there's very low economic viability there because there's no reason for people to want to invest there because there's no capital that they can capitalize on, right? Why? Because the infrastructure there, like the amount, of the people you have there, is not viable enough. What we say is that when we introduce middle income people to there, you get a range of employability. You're able to get both your managers as well as your low income groups within the same region. It becomes a lot more economical vi uh, uh, viable for you to enter those areas because you have greater access to human right. resource. That is the main extension coming out from closing government. Moving on, uh, moving on, uh, moving on. Therefore, uh, moving on. Therefore, right. We also, uh, the, the third extension we have is how the process of gentrification is in on itself an economic good. Notice that gentrification doesn't just come automatically, right? It requires building and therefore construction of, uh, of, this, uh, of these areas as well. We say that presents a very important opportunity because construction jobs and things, are, uh, construction jobs are, uh, are particularly things that appeal to, uh, to appeal to, to, to lower class groups as well. We say that we are able to empower these people by giving them more economic opportunities that they otherwise wouldn't yeah, have. Yeah. Uh, that they otherwise wouldn't have. So when we are able to encourage these people to be part of the gentrification process, to take on construction jobs, for example, to take on logistics jobs, for example, these are things that they otherwise wouldn't get, and therefore would uh, these are therefore income that they wouldn't have, right? We say that this has long-term effects as well. When they're able to generate some level of income, we're talking about lower class groups gradually moving to the middle class as well and becoming part of them, because eventually when they are when they are able to accumulate little wealth themselves and they are able to accumulate these things, they are then able to start their own small medium enterprises yeah, yeah. as well. Right? This is different from what Ori tries to tell you when she talks about middle class, middle class themselves starting small medium enterprises. We are talking about uh, we are talking about starting point for low income groups to move up the ladder as well. But I think the last thing we want to talk about is that what's the end goal of all these introducing of investments, introducing of um, uh, investments and all these things in lower income areas, right? We see the kind of corporate tax uh, corporate tax that we get is also much larger in nature. They, they briefly talked about this, but the impact of this and extension here is to say that 
when we are able to get, gain more corporate tax, that gives us more budget to, 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 to allocate things into like subsidies or public housing for instance. So the kind of homelessness that they want to talk about on opening opposition is heavily mitigated on closing government. That's a unique benefit that we brought to you from Kulunga, and that's why we oppose. Uh, propose. Here, yeah. we think member of government. Next, member of opposition. Before the end of my speech, proper, let's just first throw closing government out of this debate. Right? Because the only real extension they have is that economic viability. There's not, if these countries, these areas are not economically viable. Mm -hmm. But in that case, you wouldn't invest in the first place. Mm -hmm. Gentrification just wouldn't happen, right? Because you have to first invest in order for the middle class to go in. It doesn't happen the other way around. <laughs> middle class people don't go and randomly live in ghettos, saying, I pray that someday the government is going to invest, and maybe I might get, have a more there. Yeah. That's not how it works. You have to invest, right? So that's a completely stupid argument out there completely. So, I'll tell you why we bought this debate, right? In which I'll be basically dealing with uh, three main things. Because here's the thing, right? On the first thing I'm going to deal with, with the fact that opening opposition, or to you as to how it looks, we have benefits of uh, the, the cost of gentrification and what. What they didn't tell you, however, was why it's going to be actually better under our side, when we actually do pass, when we actually slow gentrification down. And that is what we want. We want equitable gentrification, where we actually get the benefits of side government as while well also mitigating the harm. So here's why, right? Because we allow, when we slow it down, we allow for people time to actually adapt to the situation. We don't, because which means, so first thing, that would mean like, if you were to give like six years notice, for instance, if before you were to uh, start building your mall and tearing down your neighborhood, right? You actually give people time to change, to find a new job, to secure new jobs, uh, and so that they can actually afford what afford these high prices. <coughs> you allow people to like, say, find new schools, yeah, and so their kids actually won't have to drop out of school when they can no longer live, live in the same neighborhood that they did. You allow them to build up support systems, so like communities can come together and raise money to ensure that these people aren't completely homeless when they actually priced out, right? Secondly, right, fact is that you actually also if, like, gentrify block by block, for instance, instead of carrying on an entire 16 block neighborhood in six months. So then, therefore, that when people see that their blocks are being tear down, they can see that the neighborhood, neighboring blocks are being tear down. They can actually understand that there's a need for them to secure better jobs, which means they're more likely to go out and find another job and secure a better job before the high prices hit their own neighborhood. That way, we're able to actually let these people to adapt, and that way, we can share the benefits of gentrification without the harm, right? So, no, thank you, brother. So here's the thing, right? What? Second thing I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to show you further reasons as to why we, we are actually going to displace a lot of poor people, which is going to also deal with um, opening government's argument about the trickle down effect. How the trickle down effect is not going to actually happen. So here's why you're also displacing people. It's not that, so even if you were an individual who owned land, right? Even if you were someone who didn't, right, you're still displaced simply because the, you, your lifestyle itself changes because the entire environment in your neighborhood now changes. Because there are no more these small shops that you can buy stuff from. Now you have like massive malls and whatnot. Which, have, which sell goods that you can't actually afford because of the fact that they are catered towards the middle class, not the poor people. And therefore, and therefore, and therefore you no longer can afford like food prices increasing or like other basic needs. Which means even if you own land, you just can't afford to live in this neighborhood, yet you are forced to leave. Which is why this idea of trickle down doesn't happen, right? So here's the thing, four reasons why. Firstly, if you only live within the city, do you get the benefits of the trickle down. Not if you're kicked out of the city, not if you live 50 miles, 25, 50 miles away from the city, right? Because now you can't access infrastructure. So maybe you have good hospitals, maybe you have good schools in the city, but if you live three hours away from the city and you potentially don't own a car, you can't access that, there's no point. Second, there's no improvement in lifestyle because even though there are luxury goods, there are luxury goods which you can't afford anyway. So therefore, uh, you don't improve that. Third, they are taking more, right? You're not going to have jobs either. Because even if you have like manufacturing in these areas, the fact of the matter is these are probably industries, not MNCs themselves, like CGs very specifically I point out, which are likely to be automated. Which means you don't get jobs there either. Or service sector jobs, where you don't have the skills to work in anyway. And that way, you anyway don't get jobs, you don't get any improvement in Fourthly and finally, there's no political power to these poor people anyway, because the, because the fact is the majority of the voters in the state are in fact middle, are in fact middle class, or upper middle class, if you want to take it more, right? Uh, 
upper middle class and middle class individuals who make the majority, which means there is absolutely no reason for you to care about these poor people who are being kicked out because they don't have the lobby power. They don't have the money, they, they don't have the votes either. So we don't really see how poor people are likely to benefit from trickle down anyway. Uh, I'll take closing. Look, so okay, so how do you bring political will towards this area? So when you have middle class that's lobbying for political uh, lobbying for things over there, that's how you bring benefits closer to lower income groups. You have, you don't bring benefits to poor people, you bring benefits to the middle class. No, oh, yeah. Yeah. Sorry, Brian, I can be right. Um, <laughs> oh, no. So the matter of fact is that look, you don't bring benefits to the middle class. You go to the poor, right? You bring benefits to the middle class. Openly. So that's <laughs> so the fact is that, that doesn't really help the most vulnerable group in society, okay, which are the poor people that we actually have to be concerned with. The middle class are not going to be harmed either way. So, point. <laughs> so here's the thing, right? We think specific, this is specifically damaging for poor people, simply because it's not as easy for them to relocate to other areas. Why? Because the fact is they have support systems which they rely on within their neighborhood. So their neighbors, for example, is a very, very important support system. Because poor people are generally a very tightly knit community that look out for each other and actually have each other's backs, right? So which means, for example, a single mom, right, who can't afford to send her kid to daycare, would probably send her kid to like the neighbor's house because the neighbor sort of looks after people's kids in that neighborhood for like a reduced price because they are neighbors. Or like, for example, if you didn't have food or you didn't have money, you can actually borrow from your neighbor because you know you know them and you're friendly. And this kind of neighborhood support system are absolutely very important. Because you don't, as a poor person, you don't have access to a lot of other structures. Right. You don't have access to like credit, uh, like banks are not going to just give you loans because you probably have bad credit, right? So you need to rely on your neighbors in order for you to get that kind of thing. You probably can't afford daycare, so you need your, so you need your, you need your neighbors to give you that kind of thing, right? And here's the problem. When you actually are forced to leave, you lose that entire neighborhood support system. Because now you have to find you start over effectively from scratch. You start over by renegotiating your friendship with your supposedly new neighbors. You have to start over by sort of coming into the community, new to a new community altogether, establishing some sort of uh, credibility as an individual. Start by making friends. All that takes time, right? And the fact is, poor people's lives hang in the balance in that time. There's absolutely nothing they can do in that. Time. There's absolutely no other support structures for them. And then, then even once they do that, right? Ten years down the line, they have to move again. And again, and again, this is an unending cycle of unsustainable development that we have on side problems. What we have on the our side is we get all the benefits that they are providing us. We get the development at some point where it actually is sustainable, where it actually benefits the most vulnerable group in society. The middle class doesn't need more benefits. We need the poor people to have the benefits. They're the ones who are the most vulnerable. We need to care about them. And only we as side closing government actually make sure that happens. Very proud of folks. Misunderstood and mischaracterized in the debate today. What exactly is the middle class that we're trying to accommodate? Like, who exactly are these people and what do they look like? Like, they come up and want to tell us that these people are like Bill Gates. You know, you're going to afford or you want like infrastructure and something that is so inaccessible to your lower class. But let me tell you where the real rich and upper middle class exist. They exist within your already developed cities, your Beijing and your Shanghai. We think that the kind of people in the middle class that we're trying to accommodate through gentrification are the lower middle classes. People who have just worked their way out of the middle, like out of the low, of the working class. People who open small businesses, small time entrepreneurs. These are the kinds of people and this is the exact type of middle class that we want to accommodate. So when we talk about the kinds of amenities and the kinds of facilities that they want and they care about, we're not talking about extremely high-end luxury brands. We're talking about things that perhaps are supermarkets, perhaps it's a step backer. We think that what these people care about is things like safety. We think what people care about are things like education. This is where what Minchia's point about motivation for the working class is extremely important. We think that these like these successful people who are able to go from the working class to the lower middle class are, are beacons of hope for the working class at the point which they see the kinds of successes that they're able to accomplish at the point which they can access to things like education. Let me tell you, let me give you, let me give you a reason 
that break and walk you through why exactly yeah. the lower middle class is going to be willing to want to encourage things like education and why because of their presence within these areas are the working class parents more likely to be willing to send their kids to schools because they recognize yeah. the power of education and the fact that education is able to buy you a better future and able you to work in better businesses and better infrastructure. We think that all these are extremely important, we think that all these have been completely enough yeah. and we think that these are exclusive benefits oh, that my extension was able to provide for you. But let me also tell you why, the, why these people are going to be willing to fund things like education and improve infrastructure. We're going to extend this by telling you. It's because as young, like, as like small time business owners and entrepreneurs, these are the very people that they want to hire. They are able to, perhaps, they, they are able to, like, they recognize that they need to be able to educate the kinds of workers that they have so that they can compete with the larger companies and the firms within, like, the bigger cities. But more, so we tell you that all these things mean that when the middle class, when, when the lower middle class moves into these areas and when the middle class want to be part of these areas, they are more likely to be able to improve the situation there. We also think that the unique thing about having the, the lower middle class move into these areas is that these middle class people understand best the struggles of the working class and exactly yeah, how true. to move the working class to, the, to where the they are because it's simply what they actually did. No thank you sir. Next, I want to contest the whole idea about how your mom and pop stores and all these small businesses are suddenly going to vanish. Yeah. Let me tell you your convenience stores and your mama stores continue to exist in Singapore. I think Singapore is extremely developed. The reason that this occurs is because you may have one giant supermarket, yeah. but you're not going to have one supermarket on every street. These convenience stores are convenient because of things like geographical locations, where they serve particular communities, where they serve specialized goods that serve specific needs within your community. We do not think that all this will be homogeneously absorbed by like the companies that come in. But then, what I want to deal, I want to tell you, I want to deal with something oh that opening uh, that opening didn't deal with. No, thank you, sir. Is that this whole idea of time that like they keep on harping about in the debate? Let me tell you the thing. The thing is, the process of gentrification doesn't happen overnight. It happens through a very long process, which I think everyone here agrees. So why then is it extremely problematic that a railway that's going to take ten years to build is put off for ten years to oh, start building? Yeah. It's because by the time, like this is also what happens during that time. So let me tell you exactly what my extension speaker told you about what people are going to do during this time. People are going to recognize that because of the as as the as the levels of development between the be, 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 between the richer cities and these areas and their rural hometowns start um, getting wider. They're going to see that there's very little economic it, there's, it's very economically it's not economically viable for them to stay. What does this mean? This means the kinds of urban rural migration that Minchin talked about. It means that people are going to start trying to seek jobs within the urban cities. This becomes problematic at the point where you lose the very talent pool and the very labor pool that can attract companies to be willing to move out of the big cities to come into your developing, your rapidly growing city. No, thank you, Wilson. What, okay, so what we're telling you is that these rapidly developing like, cities are, are always trying to fight with the more established cities for the kinds of businesses, the kinds of technology, and the kinds of capital investment that there is. What this means is that you're already playing catch up. And we think that yeah, the yeah. irreversible harm on their side is that you're going to make playing catch up so much more difficult yeah, at the yeah. point where you're never going to be able to attract people. And the point where these companies have set up bases that are so oh, rooted within those areas and those cities is far less likely they're going to move, even if you have the, even if you have the incentive of cheap labor within here. But we tell you another, better, another reason how we get these companies to be willing to move out to these smaller cities is that the point at which you are able to attract the middle like the middle class into your area instead of just having your manual labor. You are able to ensure that you have some level of expertise and education within your city. This means that companies are more willing to move out at the point where they know that instead of attracting more farmers to work in your farms because the farms are, are, are doing well, you attract people who understand the workings of business, who perhaps know how to operate machinery. The point where you introduce all these things, we recognize it takes a long time for people to be able to adapt. Everything that is extremely necessary right. then, then we are able to happen now, so that 10 years from now, we are able to be as competitive as those big cities. We think that every day that you waste, <coughs> means that you waste away the opportunity yeah, to yeah. help and enable the working class to move out of their circumstances and to break that cycle of poverty. We, we do not think that keeping them stuck in that cycle of poverty without development <coughs> is the way to go. Yes, yeah. The difference between a rapidly growing city like Hyderabad and an urbanizing city like Tamil Nadu is that a rapidly growing city moves 10 times faster than an urbanizing city does. Why is that speed legitimate? Okay, so we're saying, right, we're allowing gentrification to happen at a natural speed. We're not going to accelerate it, but we're not going to slow it down as well. We think that the natural speed occurs for a reason. That means that there is demand for this kind of growth. That means that you have this labor to accommodate that kind of growth. This means that you are at the optimal position to be able to snatch and compete with the large companies for it. We think that is extremely important. So let me tell you exactly what are the kinds of benefits at the point in which you are able to, like, where you enable these communities to be able to compete with the largest. 
This means that you get to avoid things like urban rural migration, which causes a host of social problems for families that are left behind and for the economy because at the point in time where you lose your young and your efficient workforce, it becomes extremely difficult for you to get them there. We see this a case, it really seems, we see this in rural areas in China, where even though the rural areas, the rural areas struggle to develop because all their young workforce chooses <coughs> to go elsewhere in the more urban cities yeah, yeah. because they recognize it's the only place that allows them to earn an income that is sustainable. We think that the way to prevent these people from leaving is to keep this talent pool within your area. And the only way they can keep this talent pool in your area is to be able to develop your cities yeah, yeah. To, a, to at least a level where you can compete with these established cities. We think that for this to happen, it means that what? It has to happen as fast as possible. Yeah. We also think that this means that you have to be able to introduce <coughs> the middle class and to modernize, that, and to modernize communities such that <coughs> the working class are incentivized to give up their farms or move away from their farms to send their children to school so their children can be educated and can take up the jobs and opportunities the gentrification offers. just point out a few points of general agreement among the House before we go about making this pretty messy. So I think both sides of the House agree that the ultimate actor that we really want to benefit are poor people first and to a certain extent like middle class who rely on certain essential services who are likely to be living in this city and therefore benefit from the kind of gentrification that we talk about. We also recognize that they've considered a major point which they were willing to take a trade-off for, which is that they acknowledge that a significant dis part of displacement is going to happen. That yes, there are certain people who are going to lose their houses in the inner city and whatnot. Their solution to this, and this was carried on throughout the entire government bench, was to say that somehow there is uh, suddenly enough government revenue and political capital to develop the outskirts. I think this argument hasn't been responded to so far, so yeah, I'll use yeah. that incubator, right? Yeah. So, interestingly, I think Opening, argument, uh, opening government ran a case that was premised upon the benefits of gentrification. Unfortunately, their case was extremely not nuanced in the sense that they did not differentiate how these benefits change uh, in, in terms of if we just simply slow it down versus not having it at all. Their arguments apply if on the upside we are arguing that we shouldn't have gentrification at all, but that's not the case, right? What we want, especially from closing government, is equitable gentrification. And to that extent, I think a lot of the arguments they brought are mooted. So since like, the arguments from closing essentially rely on the same logic as opening. I'm just going to cluster them together a little bit. The first main clash I think in this debate is whether poor people will actually benefit. Here, I think Kavindra provided you the specific analysis that even taking into their best case scenario, that you are able to create certain types of jobs like what they talk us about construction, uh, services, logistics that happen during the process of gentrification. The necessary economic picture that they painted us means that first of all, prices will increase in these neighborhoods as more affluent people move in. This means that even if you're able to keep your job, keep your land, you will necessarily be priced out. <coughs> but more importantly, we gave you also the alternative that was missing in OO, which is to say that if, for example, only the adjacent neighborhood in your uh, oh, around you, you, no thank you, I'll take you at 530. No, even only the adjacent neighborhood in, in oh, your yes. only the adjacent neighborhood gets no thank you please stop barricading. Uh, adjacent neighborhood gets uh, gentrified first. What you are then able to do as a single mom is to go to this neighborhood, for example, perhaps a Starbucks or Whole Foods or whatnot opens up and therefore provides a higher income job. You are then able to adjust and actually benefit compared to this idea that because developers want to develop the area very quickly to maximize their profit incentive, you are given like a six month notice to move out and therefore you cannot possibly benefit from the jobs that come after gentrification has already been completed. That is the nuance that was missing from their case that was never address because the trickle down effect takes place in a very specific process where you need to have jobs and the income opportunities available first before carrying out gentrification in these areas. That is the analysis that they were missing. No thank you. Again like 530 guys don't bear me. Okay more importantly right the entire argument on how we are going to benefit poor people rests simply on the assumption that if we are going to uh, if we are going to displace them, like what I've mentioned, then somehow there's going to be enough government revenue to uh, redirect to these people to, yeah, I'll, I'll take closing now, you better need to watch out, yeah. Uh, uh, there's somehow enough state revenue to go to poorer people in the city outskirts. But I think to, to the extent that Kavindra brought you very accurately in his analysis, 
that a lot of your resources and the money that you get from these new areas are still going to be prioritized to your inner cities where currently now no poor people live because they've been displaced to the outer line areas. It is unsure where this political capital and desire to benefit them comes from. What you are essentially doing is replacing an urban ghetto and making it an outskirts ghetto, which is even worse now because again, no access to essential services and whatnot. They say that gentrification brings less crime, brings a lot of like better education services for the middle class they like. Yeah, we agree. Because you've simply shifted these problems somewhere else. You've relocated the problems instead of solving them. Under our model, and this is specific from what Kavindra gave you, we actually solve them because if you slow down the process, you enable families to adapt, to, to, tell their, to, to perhaps tell their family, to perhaps get higher income jobs and therefore benefit from trickle down. For example, oh, okay. not having it not having been forced to pull their kids out of school because they cannot live in those neighborhoods anymore and so forth. This is the exceptionally nuanced analysis, no thank you Brian, that was not given. So let's take a look at yeah, some major, major solutions to this. Because I think if there was one, it only came in closing, which uh, closing with uh, opening government whip, which actually addresses the debate. She brought up this uh, extension, and I think this is the true extension of how um, the cities that you are competing against will now have a higher foothold because you are not gentrifying as fast and therefore you are losing out a lot of these like jobs and economic opportunities to these cities, right? So we say, look, first of all, this is first of all, gentrification doesn't happen uh, does, doesn't happen this, that way, mainly because you Oh yeah, here it is, sorry. Yeah. So it's quite simple if you want to balance like the disparity between cities in a large country, right? You just implement this policy nationwide, like you just slow it down nationwide. But even if that's not the case, you see the thing is, even if you don't capitalize on this opportunity today, that opportunity doesn't simply go away. It remains there because, because the profit incentive and what drives people to want to gentrify in the first place is that the land in your area is cheap, it is near a lot of neighborhoods that are rich, and these factors are constants. They are not going to change. Therefore, if we don't develop them today, the desire is still going to remain to develop them later on. It's not like there is such a limited amount of funds right, for these like, rich ass property developers to spend like only on one area. No, like we, we, we think we, the benefits will still materialize, but just later on. That's why this whole dichotomy about like first world city, uh, like better cities versus like poorer cities doesn't really work uh, anyway, because the economic incentive is still there. Oh uh, yeah, take a look. Sir, before the middle class even moves in, you need to employ the working class to build those factories, to build those housing. Therefore, their incomes will increase as well. Yeah, so you're going to employ them in construction jobs, right? Yeah, are those higher income? Are those the kinds of jobs that you think will benefit them with gentrification incomes? Are these the kind of jobs that will enable them to shop at Whole Foods instead of like the local shop? No, I don't think so, right? The entire, the entire case from opening has been, been, have been, has been like premised on this basis that when only after gentrification happens, then the benefits and trickle down come about. Their process analysis is entirely wrong. So I think on the wing of this debate, it's extremely important to realize that the benefits, again, on our side, still happen. What we then do is we formalize the process to ensure that more of these benefits flow to poor people instead of sacrificing their interests to benefit another group. And because that's, where, no, that's not where the real inequality lies, right? The real inequality doesn't lie between like the upper middle class and upper middle class and rich, because all of them can afford to go to like decent schools. The real inequality lies in people who are in the inner city and very poor can't really afford to go to school because they have to go out and work and support their families and whatnot. I think because we necessarily fulfill the burden of defending that group that is more vulnerable and more oppressed better, we necessarily take this debate. Thank all speakers for the debate. Please cross for, shake hands, and leave the room while we can do the talk. Are you there? I thought it's closed. No, no, don't close. I want to know if I can.